Hello everybody. We will start the next unit Pharmacology of Drugs Acting on Central Nervous System. I will try to cover this unit as small small video lectures lasting about 10 minutes. So the first topic that I am going to cover is Overview of Central Nervous System Neurohumoral Transmission. And under this I will be talking about why is the study of central nervous system important and what are the different steps in the neurohumoral transmission in the central nervous system. So first, why is the study of central nervous system important? There are many reasons why the study of central nervous system is important but I am going to list only four prominent reasons. The first one is there are wide range of chemical mediators. In the central nervous system, do you know how many chemical mediators are there? I am going to list a few of them. Glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, dopamine, adrenaline and noradrenaline, 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin, histamine, glycine, adenosine, melatonin, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, endocannabinoids, androgens, estrogens, nitric oxide, substance P, neuropeptide Y, brain derived neurotropic factor etc. This is just the tip of an iceberg. There are large number of neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, cotransmitters etc. in the central nervous system. In this we are going to look at uh, a few of these like glutamate, GABA, dopamine, serotonin and a little bit about glycine. Okay, So there are large number of neurotransmitters, they act on their respective receptors. Some of them are ion channel linked receptors, some of them are G protein coupled receptors, some of them are kinase linked receptors and some of them are nuclear receptors. You know, there are wide range of receptors, there are many subtypes of receptors and these are distributed not uniformly, different regions have different concentrations of these neurotransmitters. So, you know, it is quite complex. The second thing is the complexity of the neural network. For example, each neuron makes approximately 1000 to 10,000 synapses with other neurons. This is very interesting. With over a billion neurons and each neuron is making approximately 1000 to 10,000 synapses. Number of synapses means connections number of connections are going to be huge. So here is a picture that depicts a neuronal connection. This is a very simple picture but the actual the, the reality is much more complex. Here you see neuron 1 is forming synapse with neuron 2 and neuron 2 is forming a synapse with neuron 3 which in turn connects to neuron 1. So here look at the type of synapses. This red neuron, this is the axonal terminal of the neuron. It forms connection or synapse with another neuron. So this is a neuron-neuron synapse or this neuron is forming synapse with the postsynaptic neuron. Similarly, it also forms connection with itself, this axonal branch is forming a synapse with the cell body of the same neuron. This may either stimulate further synaptic release or it may inhibit action potential. We, we can't predict. It all depends on the type of neuron. Similarly, another branch of this axon is forming a synapse with its presynaptic neuron. So here you can see that neuron forms synapse with the postsynaptic neuron with a presynaptic neuron and with itself. This is quite complex. And if you want to know how complex the entire system is, I am going to quote the words of V. S. Ramachandran, an Indian American neurobiologist. The human brain is the most complexly organized structure in the universe. The brain is made up of 100 billion neurons 
and each neuron makes approximately 1000 to 10000 synapses with other neurons this is a very large number how large this number is if the possible permutations and combinations of brain activity is calculated the number of brain states exceeds the number of elementary particle in the known universe so human brain is a fascinating organ coming to the third reason why the study of central nervous system is important is that if you look at the effect of neurotransmitters and drugs on the time scale they range from milliseconds that is in milliseconds these can modulate neurotransmission the drugs can modulate neuro alter or modulate neurotransmission to days where they can actually influence synaptic plasticity synaptic plasticity is the ability to form or unform connections that are already present in the present in the system so they can modulate synaptic plasticity and delayed pharmacological effects are seen this is seen with uh, certain antipsychotics and antidepressant drugs when you start giving the drug today the drug may start showing effect only after a week or two so there is a delayed pharmacological effect that is seen so the effect of the neurotransmitters and drugs can range from milliseconds to days to months or years where structural remodeling is facilitated the drugs may facilitate structural remodeling which can lead to degeneration or regeneration of neurons the fourth reason is there are a wide range of pathological conditions affecting central nervous system have you heard of neurological disorders behavioral disorders neurodegenerative disorders how many of these can you list maybe alzheimers parkinsons depression insomnia epilepsy schizophrenia mania social phobias obsessive compulsive disorders autism how many of these can you list 20 25 but do you know how many neurological conditions are there there are more than 600 neurological diseases the number is huge that is another reason why it is very important to know central nervous system physiology the pathology of cns and the drugs affecting cns so with this brief introduction now let me move on to the neurotransmission in central nervous system you have already learned neurotransmission in autonomic nervous system here also the processes are almost the same let us have a look at them what you see here is a presynaptic neuron a postsynaptic neuron and a non neuronal supporting cell like the glial cells in the presynaptic neuron the neurotransmitters are stored in vesicles shown like this whenever an action potential reaches the axonal terminal the voltage gated calcium channels open allowing entry of calcium from outside to inside the cell increased concentration of calcium intracellularly will promote fusion of the vesicles with the membrane and further the release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft these released neurotransmitters then bind with the receptors located on the postsynaptic neuron and activate or deactivate the secondary messenger systems and may result in signal transduction now depending upon the neurotransmitter and the type of receptors it will produce either excitation or inhibition for example an excitatory neurotransmitter like glutamate may cause depolarization and excitation of the postsynaptic neuron whereas inhibitory neurotransmitter like gaba or glycine will cause hyperpolarization of the neuron and inhibition of the neuron later the neurotransmitter 
dissociates from the receptors and diffuse away. Now what will happen to the neurotransmitters that are diffused? These neurotransmitters may either be taken up by the neurons through reuptake transporters or these neurotransmitters may be taken by the supporting glial cells or these neurotransmitters may be metabolized and degraded. So these are the different steps in the neurotransmission. This winds up today's topic and before I wind up I would like to uh, suggest a few reading materials. Neuropharmacology is a fascinating branch of medicine. If you are interested, you can read these books. The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. You will, you will definitely enjoy this book. And of course, The Telltale Brain and Phantoms in the Brain by V.S. Ramachandran. Thank you very much.